Good evening, everyone. It is so wonderful to see you all. Welcome to Radnor Memorial Library. My name is Pam Sador. I see all my friends, so many familiar faces. Our partner this evening, of course, is our beloved Radnor Historical Society. Let's hear it for the society. We've all shared great times in this room. We've never had anything on the walls. Ten years we've been having author, presentation. It's just been wonderful these past ten years, my tenure just doing events here at Radnor Library. The Windsor Sisters, what well, was just a few weeks ago when we properly ensconced the Windsor, Windsor Sisters. They're right there on the back of the wall. And that was done with Radford Historical Society and the League of Women Voters of Radford Township. That was a wonderful event here in the winter room. But tonight, the guest to be stumps is all of these gorgeous photographs from the Radnor Historical Society archive. I'm not going to talk as much because Phil has so much to cover. But I just wanted to thank you all for coming this evening. This is uh, just a wonderful thing that we can share as a community and to celebrate uh, the history of Radnor Township with these beautiful photographs. This is a permanent installation. And Heather and Holly, is Holly here tonight? And Helen? And Annie, yeah, it was when I came downstairs, when I first saw these, I was just blown away. I did not know that this was going to happen in the winter room. So it was a big surprise, and I'm so glad we can share it all tonight. Um, let me tell you about Phil. Phil, local historian Phil Graham, he's a business studies graduate from the City of London Polytechnic, lived and worked in London for over 50 years. After 30 years of traveling between the UK and the US, he embraced American citizenship and settled in Radnor. Because of Graham's interest in local history and experience in digital photo enhancement, it was a natural fit when asked by David Nelson Wren to restore over 200 images for his book, The Last Great Estate <clears throat> on the Philadelphia Main Line, or we know it as Ardrossan. So, Please welcome Bill Grant. Hello. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming. Uh, now, I've got an awful lot to cover this evening, so if I go too fast, shout and slow me down. Um, and I'm just going to crash right in and see how many photos we can get through before my friend Pam shuts me up and throws us all out. So, um, I don't know about you, but when I see old photos like these that we have on the wall here, I always want to see more and know more. Now, each of them has taken me down rabbit holes that led to stories I wouldn't otherwise have come across. And those are the stories I want to talk about this evening. In the process, I've compiled numerous family trees and even tracked down some of the descendants to try and verify that the people are indeed who we think they are. My approach was to put the more obvious information to one side, question everything, look for new evidence, and search for a fresh look at whatever story I could find in the photo itself. Now the first phase of my analysis is discovering what might be hidden in the photos. I experiment with the darker areas, I read all the written signs, look at the clothing and so on. Then comes the restoration. The restoration process is very different, and to do it properly, I have to be sure I already understand everything in the photo. So all the images you see here needed different degrees of restoration to counteract fading, remove water stains, torn edges, blotches, dust, etc. They were all initially returned to black and white, as the original glass plate or celluloid negative would have been, and then redeveloped electronically and given a tint that seemed to best reflect the mood of each photo for, for optimum display here. My brief from the library was that they should not only be appealing to look at, but that they fit onto the aluminum plates you see here, which only had a limited number of shapes and sizes. So in some cases, that was something of a tall order. Um, where I found two or more shots of the same scene, I combined them to show more of a panorama, and a notation has been added to those captions so that everybody knows. Um, I'll start with a couple of examples of glass plates in the Historical Society archive that aren't on display here, 
but will quickly demonstrate my point about revealing what isn't immediately obvious to the eye. For these purposes, I'm not interested whether the photographer was trying to create a moody shot for art's sake, but I wanted to know from a historical perspective what else was actually in the photo. But without significant enhancement, we often really can't see what the photographer actually saw. So the first is of a woman playing the piano here in Wayne in the early 1900s. And my first question was, I wonder what she's playing. So we optimize the music as much as we can. We blow it up. And while I'm not quite sure it's readable, uh, anyone who can read music better than me might be able to get the gist of it. Secondly, I can see there's some sort of wall decoration or picture above the piano. And now you can see that it's a tapestry of a, of a, of a very specific scene, which again, somebody might be able to identify. Now the second example is of a very underexposed Victorian style dining room. Uh, when this photo was taken, it would have taken hours of manipulation, much trial and error, not to mention expensive materials in a dark room, to individually allow a different amount of light exposure on each object. But these days we can play with each little area and enhance it digitally to the point where eventually the room comes alive. Now these are both examples of pretty good quality photos where the information is mostly there, but they had both been underdeveloped or lazily developed. Each item just needed to be picked out and separately enhanced to be seen. But of course in a traditional darkroom that's no easy task. So let's kick off with an example which is in the display here. It's number two on your hymn sheet and it shows residents on Walnut Avenue around 1890. And this is how it cleaned up. Now from what I've discovered so far, on this day the photographer was documenting his friends, a party of young picnickers, on their way to a St. David's church fair. Another photo in the same series shows them loaded up for departure on a pony and trap. They were all significant members of the community, Sayen, Pinkerton and Fenimore are just a few of the names that might be familiar to people, but as the original caption said, it was really all about the clothing. So my job here was to try and pick out the detail and make sure the faces were evenly visible. So I'll just point out the young lad sitting front left. His name is on the Township War Memorial, so you know where I'm going next. This was Billy Schultz, who was tragically killed in action 28 years after this photo in the closing days of World War I, and he's buried in France. His sister-in-law, Emily Sayen Schultz, back left, left us the most amazing scrapbooks documenting those harrowing years, and they're still awaiting digitization. I'll also just mention the cyclist, his name was Olney Crowsdale. By 1900, he lived in Dalesford and was reputedly the first owner of an automobile on the main line. According to the Atlantic Reporter, he was also the winning plaintiff in a Pennsylvania Supreme Court case in which he was able to reclaim earnings from the rental of a steamboat, of which he was part owner. At that time, he was a traveling salesman in the employ of the Pioneer Suspender Company. <laughs> later bought and sold by local entrepreneur Ralph Roberts, who established Comcast. Crowsdale spent most of his time traveling away from the area, selling wholesale armbands, belts, suspenders, and garters. So what he's wearing under his outer garments here, we can only guess. <laughs> um, it's an example of one of the more difficult photos that needed many hours of work to make it presentable at a larger size, as well as properly revealing everything that the photographer actually captured on camera. My feeling is that we cannot ignore current technology if we want to draw the next generation into history. Conveying as much of the atmosphere of a scene as one can by enhancing a picture is the best way to make it more interesting. The important thing to remember is that if future generations want to go back to the original source material for reinterpretation, they can. That's why we have properly documented archives. And as new technology comes along, so people will be able to start all over again. So anyway, if you take a quick look at the houses in the background of this picture, you'll see that although the shrubbery is taken over, the same houses are still there to this day. That's Walnut Avenue. Now let's head over to Rosemont, and number three on the wall is Whitehall Station. You may recognize it as today's Bryn Mawr Hospital thrift shop on the corner of Glenbrook Avenue and County Line Road opposite the hospital. And here it is as a stereo card shot from a similar angle back in 1865. Just flip backwards. Um, I'll come to the story behind it in just a minute, but it's a perfect example of a photo that was modified back in the 1800s 
to produce a fun but totally synthetic 3D effect when viewed through a stereoscope. And of course they were the original forerunner to the virtual reality productions we have today. As you can see, the stereo card is made up of two similar images side by side taken simultaneously. The differing center points of each photo meant that when viewed through the scope, it created the illusion of a 3D image. So to create the immersive effect, the left picture shifted one way with more on the right and the right picture the other way with more on the left. And the separation between our two eyes left our brains to interpret the rest. But without viewing it through a stereoscope, this might not make much sense. This same shot was also produced as a hand-colored photograph, which I believe was used for a postcard. So both versions contained a different type of artificial modification which made the image more attractive. They became accepted in their time and both adaptations have now entered the annals of history. But what I did for our version on the wall here was the complete reverse. I combined all the separately available images to recreate the scene as a flat photograph in just one color. This is as close as I can get to how an original photo would have looked at the time. The old versions are very poor quality, so I used all three here because although the stereo had more image area, it was partly damaged. Stereoscopes gained mass popularity through Queen Victoria's patronage at London's Great Exhibition in 1851 and quickly made photography an important tool both for education and enjoyment. And that's precisely our intention in adapting some of the photos in this room 170 years later. At the time, photography purists saw the stereoscope as a gimmick and took great exception to it. Considering photography had always been a translation of 3D to 2D, to have it go another step and make fake a return back to 3D was against what they believed to be photography's intended purpose, i.e. to create an impression of reality, not reproduce it. But it was highly popular and profitable, so many photographers found themselves taking their classical photos first and tacking on a stereoscopic view second to sell as an add-on. So my point is, just like portrait paintings that preceded photography by hundreds of years, as technologies became available, so photos have been somewhat manipulated to create someone's idea of a more dramatic reality. But briefly back to the story, in the 1830s, a company called the Main Line of the Public Works of the State of Pennsylvania, which as we all know gave rise to the name the Main Line, routed this section of the Columbia Railroad half a mile south of where it is today and trains first stopped at the Whitehall Hotel, opposite today's Rosemont Wawa. Mm -hmm. 25 years later, in 1857, the Pennsylvania Railroad bought this line, and by 1860 had constructed the building you see in this photo, for use as a passenger station, ticket office, and telegraph office. On Saturday, April 22, 1865, the same year as this photo, President Abraham Lincoln's funeral train crossed eight states on its way from Washington to Springfield, Illinois. It passed through over 400 stations, including this and several others in Radnor. According to a 1957 thesis, it was said that the train stopped here to take on ice and water. However, newspaper accounts from 1865 state that an embalmer and funeral director were with his body the whole time, with the job of constantly refreshing the corpse as best they could without refrigeration. When it passed here, it was the seventh day of a 20-day funeral cortege. And those same accounts stated that the job of preservation became increasingly futile along the way. With or without ice, it sounds like they were fighting a losing battle. But since there were dozens of wealthy dignitaries and politicians on the train, if they did stop here for ice, it was more likely for refreshing their gin and tonics. <laughs> we do know Lincoln also passed through Whitehall Station two years earlier, this time en route to Gettysburg under slightly more cheerful circumstances. County Line Road on the right side of this photo was a plank road in 1865 made up of wooden boards laid side by side over what often became a foot of mud. The only non-dirt road at this time was Lancaster Pike and even that was full of potholes. I guess in that respect things haven't changed much. <laughs> now by 1869 the Pennsylvania Railroad had straightened the line eliminating the Whitehall curve. They made a deep cutting through the hill further north and in so doing made this old station redundant. The old route seen on the left here became Railroad Avenue and then Glenbrook Avenue, named after the adjacent farm. The station then became a residence and in 1893 was bought by Bryn Mawr Hospital to be used as an isolation <coughs> building for contagious diseases. Finally, in 1929, it became the hospital's thrift shop. Allegedly, the steel magnate Andrew Carnegie once worked here as a young telegrapher. 
and although that occupation is mentioned in his biography, it doesn't actually specify which station. So why am I showing you a picture of the Yang Ming restaurant? <laughs> well, this is the same building just over 100 years ago. This is number 18 on your sheet, Lipping Cotton E.D. General Store, round about 1912. In 1831, a two-acre two triangle of land bordered by Roberts, Old Lancaster and County Line Roads was sold by the Roberts family to Henry Lawrence of Marple. He erected the shell of a large stone building built with old mortar and limestone walls and split cypress shingles. The interior burned out several times over the years, but as it was then adjacent to the original line of the Pennsylvania Railroad through Whitehall Station, it was used at different times as a freight station, a warehouse, and then a general store and post office, as we see here around about 1912. The general store was first run by Thomas Crosley and his wife until 1869, when it changed hands and became more widely known as the West Haverford Store. The new owners advertised it as William H. Ramsey and Bro, dry goods, groceries, flour, paints, etc. At that time, as we saw in the last photo, the railroad passed Whitehall Station along what's now Glenbrook Avenue over our left shoulder in the picture here and crossed diagonally to our right in front of the building, then eventually crossing Lancaster Pike at Rosemont Square roughly through today's Hope's Cookies. <laughs> and again, when the line was rerouted, this building also had to be repurposed. But for that decade, it was a prime location, a major junction both for rail and road freight, as well as for cheapskate travellers avoiding the tolls on the nearby Lancaster Pike. In 1896, the building was owned by Weaver and Baldwin, who ran it as Baldwin's store. Some here will still remember it as the Conestoga Mill dining room and bar, as it was from 1940 to 1990. In 1941, you could buy an Easter dinner special here, with a choice of ham, turkey or chicken, all for a dollar. You may read that it was once the Rose and Crown Inn and the Seven Stars, but neither is true. They were both further east in Lower Merion. The hanging sign over the entrance reads, Ye Olde Store, and the same words can also be made out on one of the right-hand delivery trucks, which reads, Lippincott and Ede, Ye Olde Store Grocers. On the left is a gas pump, and next to it a sign by the side of Conestoga Road, which reads, Danger, Run Slow, Use of Muffler Cutout Prohibited. Muffler cutout was a way of increasing horsepower, but it's also increased, it also increased noise and pollution. Today, muffler cutout is illegal pretty much everywhere other than on racetracks. During the Lippincott and Ede era, the upstairs loft was also a community gathering place. Minstrel shows and prize fights were presented there, and fight fans would have seen Jack Johnson here before he became world boxing champion in 1908. Jack Johnson was known as the Galveston Giant, and at the height of the Jim Crow era, he became the first African-American world heavyweight boxing champion. For 13 years, he was arguably the most famous and notorious African-American on earth. He was persecuted relentlessly by the US government for marrying white women in three separate marriages, and in that connection was convicted of a totally fabricated felony. Last year, 105 years after his conviction, and 72 years after his death, he was finally pardoned by the current president after intervention by Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> this brings me to number 10, the Wayne Natatorium in 1897 on the south side of Willow Avenue, west of Cowan Park. This image is actually made up of two separate photographs with about 50 feet between them. But by joining the two together, it gives a much broader sense of the crowds down the left side of the pool on competition day, as well as the sheer size of the pool. The right side shows what it looked like originally. And on the left is the small section I added on from another photo. Where you see the word amended in the captions, scenes have been combined to show a simulated broader scene. The Natatorium was one of the largest freshwater swimming pools in the US and fed by Gulf Creek. In winter, there was an annual carnival and it became a skating pond. Lights were strung in the trees and fresh gingerbread was sold. The original clubhouse shown here at the western end still stood until recently as a private house, until a fire in 2017, since when it's been redeveloped. You can also see in the background the chimney of the Wayne Steam Heat Plant, which operated from 1895 to 1948, roughly on the site of today's Do It Best hardware store. The Natatorium was designed by Francis Gugert of Wayne, who became associated with the famous architect David Knickerbacker Boyd. The R.H. Johnson Company was awarded the contract for excavating and constructing a pool about 500 feet long with an average width of about 100 feet. 
A filtering system cleaned the water from the creek before entering, and a tall privacy fence surrounded the site. In the clubhouse at the far end, the first floor was a ladies' dressing room, and the second was living quarters for the manager. A men's dressing room was built midway along the pool, just off the left side of this photo, on piles over the water. There were also diving boards and a slide at the deep end, and the shallow end had a wooden bottom. For $25, anyone could purchase an annual membership, which included winter skating, and there was also a daily rate. At the formal opening in July 1895, a large crowd of amateur swimmers, representing many organizations, was present. At this time, women were not allowed to compete. The first swimming instructor was an Englishman from Yorkshire, who, it is said, had an accent so thick he was barely comprehensible. <laughs> so I hope you can understand me a little better than that. <laughs> he was later succeeded by George Kistler, the champion mile swimmer of the world. They taught all ages to swim and also ran Red Cross life-saving courses. A description of their early teaching methods later ran in the Suburban and Wayne Times. It reads, a telegraph pole was sunk in the ground at each end of the pool with a heavy wire cable stretched across the water. To this was added a rope on a pulley with a belt attached at the waterline. The pupil was strapped into the belt and thus taught the art of swimming without danger of going under. <laughs> Christenings also took place here and at one such event the boardwalk gave way and the spectators all fell into the water. <laughs> but unfortunately cell phones weren't allowed or I'd be showing you that footage now. For a number of years, the Natatorium was a great success. Then the cycling craze reached its height, and attendance dwindled while former patrons went off on long bike trips instead. Then at about the turn of the century, a general drought made it necessary for the Wayne Waterworks Company to sink a number of artesian wells to augment the town's supply. This dried up several large springs along the creek, which had fed the pool. In 1903, R.H. Johnson, the original builder, became the owner of this sad and empty pool, and the following year, he, in turn, sold it to local developer F.H. Treat, who announced to the North Wayne Protective Association, we will soon fill it up. And so he did. He filled it up with houses. This is it today, and I've circled what survives of the clubhouse at the back. A blue state historical marker now stands beside Cowan Park on Radnor Road, at the opposite end from the former clubhouse. So let's come back to this end of town, to Conestoga Road, where it joins West Wayne Avenue. This is number four, the log cabin. Best estimate for the year of this photo is about 1880, as documented in Catherine Cummins' well-respected book and bicentenary map, even though someone has attempted to date it as being nine years later, scribbled on the photo. But the cabin had certainly disappeared from maps by 1887, and was probably demolished when a whole series of new buildings went up there in 1885. And this is the same photo restored. So let's first take a look at what's in this photo. Two women, four men, one little girl, about two years old, and a horse. The empty washing line across the foreground has a makeshift wooden prop supporting it. To the left is an axe lying on the ground. Hard to see, but it's uh, lying on the ground at the front there. Corn is growing to the left of the house. The man in the doorway wears a watch chain from his waistcoat. And apart from the man holding the horse and whip, they all appear to be dressed in respectable clothing. The wood shingle on the porch is half missing and partly covered with a piece of cloth over the bare frame. One second floor window appears to be missing. Under the porch, you can see shiny cooking utensils and a washboard hanging on the outside wall. There's certainly no electrical supply and water probably came from a well. Its location has been described in various accounts over the years in different ways and we now know it was in the proximity of the Wayne Art Centre on Conestoga Road. At least two maps from the late 1800s show that it stood very roughly on the site of what's now an advertising agency opposite the southwest end of Bloomingdale Avenue. Before the P&W came through in 1906, this section on the southwest side of Conestoga Road, then known as Old Lancaster, consisted first of far farmland and then from about 1880 a stone quarry. The quarry was the largest in the area and was open for bridge and culvert stone for the widening and straightening of the Pennsylvania Railroad. About five years after this photo, in 1885, the quarry was bought by R.H. Johnson, who built the natatorium, among other things, and that's when it seems the log cabin was demolished. In the 1700s, this had been the modest home of the George family, who owned the entire 200 acres from Conestoga Road westward to what we now know as the Milldam Club. Later, another map from 1860 shows this same house labelled Mrs. E. Siter, and in brackets below, Woodland Home. 
Elizabeth Siter was the widow of Adam Siter, a descendant of the family who owned various mills, including Siter's Mill, which later became Edward's Mill and now the Mill Dam Club. They also owned several tanneries and hostelries in the area, including the Unicorn Tavern, where the Flag Lady was, and the Spread Eagle Hotel in the area previously known as Sitersville and now Eagle Village. The family also owned a wonderful house further east along Conestoga Road beside the P&W Ithan Station. Anyway, we now know that this was our log cabin and even much later with our family here around 1880, the name Woodland Home seems very appropriate. Seventy years ago, the Suburban and Wayne Times wrote, this small cabin was unique in this section it stood back of the First Baptist Church between Conestoga Road and very close to Johnson's quarries. The group of five, actually it was, you can see from my restoration, it, it's seven. The, the guy behind the horse at the back is now visible. Originally he, it was almost impossible to see him. And the little girl was also completely hidden in uh, the other guy's uh, pants at the front there. Um, the group of five or seven with a horse belonging to one was evidently specially posed for the picture when it was taken in the 1880s. I'm, I'm quoting here again from uh, the Suburban and Wayne Times. And the article continues, there is something very appealing in the figure of the woman at the right with her hands folded over her ample white apron. So that account was written when there still would have been residents alive who remembered it. So this consistently reconfirms the location. So we have the location, but who were they? I've only found one family listed in that little area who might possibly fit the bill, and they're in the 1880 census named Smiley. Their listing is next to the Sayen family, who were their closest neighbours to the northwest, on the site of the present-day Italian American Club. Henry, 34, and Ellen Smiley, 31, lived with six children, ranging from 1 to 15 years old, but sadly no little girls the right age at that time. So as much as I want this to be the right family, the odds still seem stacked against us assuming the date is correct. I'm still hoping someone will come forward and claim them. As a footnote, there were 85 American, African Americans listed in Radnor in the 1880 census, with only eight actual households described as black or mulatto. 44 were servants in white families, six of whom were employed in J. Henry Askin's Luella mansion. And this looks to be one extended family unit, but we really can't be sure. And even if they were related, they may not all have resided here. On the day of the census, of course, it's possible that some of them were recorded elsewhere or perhaps not recorded at all if they were just passing through. Moving about a mile southeast down the road a few hundred yards is Five Points, the junction of Conestoga Road with Aberdeen, Ivan Avenue and Church Road. It's a view around 1890 looking north across Conestoga Road and down Aberdeen Avenue into Wayne. And it's from a family album kindly donated to the Historical Society by John Montgomery, who's here tonight. The album also contains several shots of John's Uncle Ned, whom he has ascertained was also the principal photographer. Uncle Ned was Edward Biddle Halsey, the son of William Halsey, a rector of St. David's Church, who was recently deceased at the time of the photos. So Ned Halsey's family home had, had been the original St. David's rectory. The photos are curious in that they were developed as cyanotypes, or blueprints as they were also known. Cyanotypes were the one medium that actually improves with age. If they've been exposed to light and have faded, all you have to do is put them in the dark and to some degree they magically self-restore. Of course this doesn't remove the yellowing of the paper. The process was invented in 1842, but didn't become popular until the early handheld camera era from 1888 to 1920 when amateurs used it to create multiple prints from their negatives with much cheaper materials. After 1920, it was really only used commercially for, com for architectural blueprints, where many copies were necessary. I'll come to who the children were in a moment, but these are the two prints from this album that interested us. And I can show you how elements of both were integrated to produce the best panorama in terms of content and clarity. The photo on the left has much better detail of a nascent Wayne town in the distance clearly showing buildings and an industrial chimney, plus an extended panorama on the far left, including the Conestoga Aberdeen signpost. On the right side is a similar shot, but it's paler and fuzzy in the distance and crops off the left signpost, but was focused for a good close-up of the children. Since there's only one space on the wall here for one scene, the obvious solution is to combine the two and get the best of both. So the close-up girls were moved from the right photo into a similar position on the left photo. 
their original position by the utility pole is erased on the left view and then the two shots are combined so you get the close-up girls plus the full clear panorama and background. The fact that the surviving copies have been printed in blue is neither here nor there. That was just a cheap developing process. By converting it to black and white, cleaning it, teasing out a little more of the detail lost on the yellowing fibrous paper in the centre distance, we now have a more accurate picture of what the photographer actually saw on that summer's day in 1890 and a clear historical record of what was actually there in the distance. It's an accumulation of all the visible elements into one scene and is as close as you can get to what anyone standing there would have seen with their own eyes around 130 years ago. And I don't know about you, but every time I drive through that junction, I think of this photo. <laughs> so on to the children. Initially, I thought they might have been the photographer's own children or younger siblings. But Ned Halsey had no children, and his siblings weren't the right ages if the date of this photo is correct. What I did notice, however, was that the same two children appear in another of his photos, standing on a porch of a new rectory which had just been built the year previously. So I wondered if perhaps they could be the children of the new rector. After a little research, I discovered that the new rector, George Keller, did indeed live there and had four children, two of whom looked to match the ages of the children standing on the rectory porch and sitting here at Five Points. So I drew up a family tree and came up with the names of some descendants around the country, some of whom have continued the family business and are themselves Episcopalian ministers. Of the two family groups who responded to me, one knew their aunts, these two children, very well. But she's currently travelling on an extended vacation and won't be able to confirm one way or the other until her return. Meantime, if I'm right, my theory is that the two children pictured here were Josephine and Mary Keller, aged about 11 years 3 months and 3 years 3 months, respectively. Fingers crossed that I can shortly put this mystery to rest when their niece gets back from her trip. This brings me on to number 25, St. David's Church, in 1863. Old St. David's of Radnor is certainly one of the oldest stone buildings around, except technically the old church isn't in Radnor. In fact, the old church, new chapel, cemetery and various outbuildings these days are spread across three townships and two counties, though when it was built it was entirely in Chester County. Of the dozens of old images available, the image on the right here was the original selected because it's obviously a big occasion and of special interest because it contains so many people. But in the right-hand photo, the photographer missed off the left side of the scene, which is very much an important part of the landscape in that era. A second photo on the left here is dated just three years earlier, and while it doesn't contain the people, it shows the missing left side without any significant architectural changes. Most importantly, it completes the roughly triangular en enclosure showing the cornfield outside the original wall. Today that field is extended cemetery. To some extent I was able to confirm that the dates of both photos matched by going to the cemetery and looking at the dates on the gravestones shown in both pictures and checking to see which ones hadn't yet been erected in the photos. I had to bear in mind that gravestones weren't always installed at the time of death, especially where they memorialized couples, and some interments were dug up and moved around during that time to improve the layout. So it was a complicated process. But in associating the two photos, I was able to confirm that fundamentally the broader scene is correct, if not perfect, when they're joined. So this is the composite of the two. However, the dating po process is tricky, and while we look at this photo, I'd like to read a short extract from the History of St. David's Church, written in 1907, by local historian Henry Pleasance. It's from a write-up of one special day during Rector William Halsey's term, and although it could be describing any such event, it seems to me to, to be describing this scene. Pleasance writes, On September the 4th, 1867, Rector William Halsey organized a celebration of the church's 150th anniversary of the erection of the church, under the erroneous impression that the building was erected in 1717. He was actually two years late. The book then quotes the write-up of that day from the Episcopalian newspaper. It was a day to be remembered, and one that will not soon be forgotten by any who participated in its interesting services. The morning was dark and threatening, like the early days to be commemorated, but as it wore on, the clouds scattered, leaving a bright and beautiful afternoon. Everything conspired to make it an occasion of interest. The happy groups of young and old gathered under the spreading branches of ancient trees, the association of the time-honoured house of God, reviving many touching reminiscences of bygone days, made a scene and occasion rarely equalled for beauty or interest. So if that doesn't summarise this photo, I don't know what does. 
But although these special gatherings, especially with newspaper coverage, were few and far between, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that it might be another occasion. Anyway, for the purposes of this display, I think it's enough to describe this as a scene from the second half of the 19th century, which, if you take away the people and costumes, is not too dissimilar to the way it looks today. So let's go to the heart of Wayne, just a stone's throw from where we are now. Built in 1871 for $30,000, the Wayne Opera House was, like the original Presbyterian chapel next door, on land donated by J. Henry Askin, the early founder of Luella, his name for Wayne. It was designed by David Glendale and originally named Lyceum Hall. The cornerstone was laid on Independence Day 1871 with a dedication ceremony in October, which over 500 people attended. In the opening address, the Lyceum Secretary said, The object of the erection of this building has been for the extension and development of knowledge, and we dedicate it sacred to the promotion of morality, purity, and mental development. Let that which is just, virtuous, and righteous be tolerated within this Lyceum. Vice of every kind obliterated. The stone came from Wayne quarries, and the building was a dull grayish brown stucco, possibly close to the way I tinted the photo here. And here debates, lectures, amateur theatricals and concerts were held. Clubs including the Alpha, Alpha Choral Society, the Euterpian Society, the Wayne Horticultural Society, Wayne Oratorio Society, the Mount Pleasant Cornet Band, Sons of Veterans, the Radnor Men's Working Club, Wayne Needlework Guild, a chess club, and a chapter of the International Order of Oddfellows. In 1889, the Wayne Estate enlarged and improved the small stage. New scene shifts and a new proscenium were added. And this is a performance of the Gilbert and Sullivan operetta Patients in the Opera House sometime in the 1890s. The building was also Wayne's first public movie theater. Silent motion pictures were shown on the second floor. The third floor contained room to seat 600 and provided new quarters for the Wayne Masonic Lodge, which I assume had its own entrance here because there's a door on the far right side with Masonic symbols. In 1903, after extensive remodeling and enlargement, the Wayne Post Office moved in on the far left. Standing on the steps outside his pharmacy is Joseph Fronfield Jr., who came here in 1881 to start his drugstore business on the eastern end of Lyceum Hall. In the notes he left us is written, The surrounding country was farmland. I could look out the drugstore door and see cattle grazing in the meadow where the business block, firehouse and schoolhouses now stand. The building was piped for gas, and had a spring-fed gas machine which was under my charge. A barrel of gasoline poured into the outside tank, plus the strength of six mules to wind up the machine, made sufficient lights for many months. The statue up on the right, set in the mansard roof, represents charity, of which there are many variations around the world. It traditionally depicts a woman, and this one is holding a child in each arm, and possibly others standing at her feet. This was either removed, or if not, certainly destroyed in the fire of 1914. If we blow up the center section, we can see the large sign below. It says, Arctic soda with choice fruit syrups and cream, Vichy clean eyes, compress, and other mineral waters. And as you can see, the man here is clearly checking his phone for messages. <laughs> in the same building here, we can see a close-up of WH Welsh & Co hardware store, and David D. Mansell Grocery and Provision Store. An old Welsh's catalogue contains 734 pages with over 4,000 items for sale. All deliveries were conducted via the single horse and buggy shown in this photo. An earlier proprietor had been J. Harry Brook in the 1880s, when it was described as a general country store selling dry goods, groceries, hardware and farming implements. Just six years after this photo, on December 30, 1914, a devastating fire broke out at 1.30 a.m., gutting the entire building. Its third-story mansard roof collapsed in the fire, never to be rebuilt. Welsh's entire stock was ruined by water. Two hours later, William Welsh had leased another store across the street in Union Hall, now the site of the Radnor Fire Company, and by late evening, it was stocked with fresh supplies brought out from the Supplee Biddle Company in Philadelphia. This is what it looked like after the fire, internally after a snowfall. And this is it externally. And here it is today, after extensive renovation. So what remains of the original building is still recognizable, though its function as Wayne's main community center has long disappeared. Unless, of course, you count going to Cole Wellness Spa for a friendly chat under the hairdryer. 
Staying with the Opera House building, here's the front left window of the same Welsh store with their daughter Harriet Ele Eleanor Welsh standing out front in 1908. Harriet lived with her parents on Runnymede Avenue until 1932 when she married a banker, William Jackson Nelms Jr. in Washington National Cathedral. His family were frequently in the society pages of the local paper in Newport News, Virginia. This little girl's own daughter now lives in Florida and her son in Virginia, and many descendants are scattered across the country. I've been in touch with some of them, and I can tell you they're absolutely delighted we're still admiring their mother's photo this evening, 100 year, 111 years later. <laughs> so I'm afraid I can't tell you much more about little Harriet, but I can tell you about the window display. At the time, it was probably unusual to see a store that sold thousands of different products, have one window section completely taken over by just one brand, Spratt's Pet Foods. But Spratt's was one of the most heavily marketed brands at this time, and their products were actually very expensive. They were the first company to manufacture prepared dog food. The inventor, James Spratt, was a former lightning rod salesman from Cincinnati, who founded his company in London. He was a relentless advertiser and managed to convince fellow Americans, who usually fed their dogs table scraps, to buy a product they really didn't need. Here in the window you can see dog cakes, basically bone shapes like the biscuit you'd buy today, biscuits for toy dogs, biscuits for cats, puppy cakes, poultry food and dog soap. We can also see copies of Spratt's Dog Culture, which was a free 100-page catalogue that also contained useful information on canine and feline diseases and their cure plus tips on how to perfect a show animal. These days you can find original copies of this on eBay for about $25. Spratt was also the first person to market different dog foods for different life stages. It's recorded that in 1876 he provided free food for exhibitors at the Centennial Exhibition. Whether that means he literally provided food for exhibitors or free samples for their pets, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> Spratt himself died in 1880, long before this photo, but is widely recognized as an early marketing genius, and his successors didn't hold back either, as we can plainly see here. Spratt's US business was bought by General Mills in the 1950s. Incidentally, the general manager of Spratt's was Charles Cruft, who founded the Cruft's dog shows. His first shows were in London's Royal Agricultural Hall in Islington, which today is known as the Business Design Center, where I coincidentally worked on an international music symposium a century later. The actual Spratt's factory in the heart of London's East End is now a very trendy apartment and office block and the original company name, the original company name still appears right across the massive building. A one bedroom 800 square foot apartment in the prestigious Spratt's building was recently listed there for just under a million dollars. And as you'd expect it's a pet friendly building. <laughs> We're continuing our tour by heading northeast to Radnor Station, which was the village formerly known as Morgan's Corner. In the US, as in other nations during the early years of development, the blacksmith was an integral part of every community. The blacksmith was held in high regard for his understanding of how things worked and his mental aptitude for creating and repairing things. He was the engineer, the mechanic, the weapon maker, tool maker, and sometimes he was even the veterinarian or dentist. I'm not sure I'd be too happy having a tooth pulled with this man's tools. But since I know nothing about smithing, I posted this photo in an online blacksmithing history forum. And here's the information the experts gave me. Our man here is spreading or forging the end of a cut piece of iron, possibly to make a small horseshoe, a tool, something for a carriage, or any small metal part. He's working on a traditional London pattern, al anvil, approximately 200 pounds in weight, made of forged wrought iron. The stand is made from a squared off tree stump with nail heads visible in it. The square-shaped hardy hole has some sort of forming tool in the slot. Next to it, to the right, is the round pritchel hole. The square end on the right is called the heel, the other end is the horn, used for shaping curved pieces. The tongs he's holding he probably made himself. He's holding his blacksmithing sledgehammer with a long handle and heavy head, unnaturally high on the handle, possibly just for the pose. A hardy cut-off for cutting metal is resting on the base at the front. A couple of chisels, gouges or punches are at the left side. The square porter holes in the waist are used to transport the anvil during manufacture and are typical of older anvils. A wooden shelf on the side is attached by two iron brackets for resting additional tools when needed. The edge of a forge can just be seen on the far left made out of bricks. What looks like a calendar depicting a horse is on the wall behind. 
but sadly no amount of enhancement here is going to reveal the year on that calendar. Blacksmiths could be both farriers who made horse paraphernalia and wheelwrights. Our man here is wearing a leather apron to protect his breeches from sparks. That's on top of several layers of clothing and a billowy loose shirt to allow air to flow and keep him cooler. And no proper man would be without a hat in that day, especially for a photograph. The phrase beat the daylight out of it came from shaping metal either around a cone mandrel or the anvil horn seen on the left. But when, only when the gap of daylight was gone between the metal part and the anvil was his piece the right shape. So who is this, where is this, and can we really date it? And that's where things get complicated. The archive description reads, small label on the front with the number 331. And then a caption typed separately, village blacksmith said to be Chris Downs, 1888. So what does this tell us? Christopher J. Downs was indeed the blacksmith listed a decade later in at least three business directories, including the 1902 Radnor directory, which at that time was exclusively the Radnor station area. The only census I found him in so far is 1900, where he's listed as blacksmith, age 33, having come from Ireland the same year attributed to this photo, 1888. His census listing is adjacent to all the familiar names you can see in this map the very same year, all around Radnor station. So from directories in the census, there's no question that Chris Downs ran the Radnor Village blacksmith shop. And according to this same map, the shop was on the site of the present-day Euro Coachwork building, opposite the 333 Bellrose restaurant on Bellrose Lane. So it's either a coincidence that 331 appeared on the photo, or perhaps that really was someone's later attempt at describing the approximate position of the building. Originally, there were no street numbers here, but everyone would have known where to find the Radnor blacksmith. But my problem with this is that if this photo really is Chris Downs, he certainly doesn't look 22, even if his profession was tough. <laughs> the date, to my mind, would more likely be about 1918, 30 years later, when he would have been 52. Or maybe the census taker just wrote down the wrong age. So either his identity or the year seem to be in question. Anyway, until I can find other records, this story is very much ongoing, and there are always new sources to check. Meantime, as a photo, I think it's another great piece of Radnor history. But let's come back southward to the St. David's Toll House. Here's our next pre-restoration photo. It's number 13, Officer Road Bar with trusty canine friend, plus his wife at the door of the St. David's Toll House in 1901. And here it is after cleaning. The Lancaster Pike was completed in 1795 when there were only nine toll houses along the full 62 mile length. Later there were 13, and since there were ultimately three in Radnor alone, that number may have increased, but the original idea had been for one every seven to ten miles. Tolls were collected till just over a hundred years ago, in 1917, when the state bought the road. They then finally auctioned off all the toll houses, and since most had been built to be moved every few years as the towns expanded, buyers could just put them on rollers and remove them to their own little plot of land. This photo was taken in winter, showing Anne Road Bar in her apron here in the background at the side of her toll house, and her husband Edward sporting his brand new Radnor police uniform. He's standing where the St. David's Golf Club was at that time, where the widened pike would be now outside TJ Maxx, and I'll show you the exact spot in a minute. It was taken when Officer Roadbar was appointed the very first policeman in the newly formed Radnor Township. An account in an old historical society bulletin runs as follows. On March 12, 1901, Edward Roadbar was hired a police officer. He was placed under the jurisdiction of the Committee on Sewers and Public Comfort and was paid $40 a month. His duties were described as follows. He shall see to people always of this district, remove all nuisances such as smelling pig pens, butcher's heaps, bad drainage, straying cattle and all things detrimental to public health and comfort and shall be empowered to improve and collect fines. So nothing was said about the apprehension of criminals or the enforcing of laws or of protecting the public from physical violence. But one month later, Radnor became the first municipality in the Commonwealth to pass a law against speeding. Anyone driving a rubber-tired vehicle in excess of 10 miles an hour would be fined, and anyone causing a horse to frighten shall instantly come to a full stop until said horse is under control. Both offences carried a penalty of $10. Such were the awesome responsibilities of the man we see here. In September 1902, records show that six people were arrested for speeding, including Samuel Chu, a cyclist. <laughs> in the previous year, 
Roadbar had been described in the 1900 census as being a farm labourer. Ten years later, his wife is described as gatekeeper of a toll house, and he has become a line man in the electric light industry, presumably something to do with cabling. Their nearest neighbours were a steward at the golf club to the east, and Dr. Jameson, the dentist, who owned Villa Florenza to the west. Villa Florenza is just visible in the background of this second toll house picture, showing the pike looking westward. It was taken in summertime about the same year as the previous one. Once again, that's presumably Mrs. Roadbar, this time in the other doorway. You can see from this photo that both buggy drivers were sitting on the right. Most were right-handed and could wield a whip on that side without worrying about striking the passenger next to them. More importantly, they could also make sure they were keeping a safe distance from the ditch at the edge of the road. The first US law requiring Pennsylvania drivers to keep to the right side of the road was passed in 1792 with the establishment of the Philadelphia to Lancaster Turnpike. And incidentally, the oldest documented regulation in the world has been traced back to 1100 BC when the Chinese Book of Rights stated, the right side of the road is for men, the center is for carriages, and the left side is for women. And since my wife drove for 40 years in England, driving on the left is what she still prefers here anyway. <laughs> now there's one other interesting photo in the archives of this same toll house. And I've juxtaposed it with a similar angle taken from Google, Google Street View about 10 years ago, before more recent shrubbery appeared. Around 1910, a new house was built to the west of the toll house, to the left in the top photo, and another one next to it after the toll house had gone in 1920. But what's interesting is that in the lower photo, I noticed a yellow patch in the grass where the sun had scorched it. My guess is that under, the, under that, there was still stone or rubble base where the toll house had stood many years previously. And each summer, it was the first patch of grass to dry out. Now, it's just a theory, but as far as I can tell, the former location of the toll house matches perfectly. And just for reference, this is an aerial view of what that same spot looks like today. Our policeman would be standing in the middle of a much widened Lancaster Pike in that oval. TJ Maxx is in the lower right corner, and the Radnor Hotel is at the top right. This is the Hughes family on the Cleaver Farm, round about 1885. This was one of the most time-intensive photos to restore because so much is wrong with it. But to my mind, it's one of the most important photos in the archive because it represents so much about the prosperous early families of Wayne. So let's look at the restored version and see what's going on here. One of the first items that raised my curiosity at the Historical Society's Finley House was a small red volume routinely described to visitors as being the 1864 diary of a doctor in the Civil War. Subsequently, I scanned every page, read the obscure handwriting from cover to cover, and discovered that instead it contained the day-to-day -day musings of a 17-year-old schoolboy. <laughs> that diary could easily be the subject of an entire presentation in itself, but suffice to say, his name was William Davis Hughes, some of whose family is pictured in that photo 20 years later. In 1874, he left West Philadelphia to live in the fledgling community of Luella, and a year later bought the homestead in a section of the old Cleaver Farm, which had given the old railway milk stop the name Cleaver's Landing, long before Wayne became a bolt hole from the smoke and smells of Philadelphia. Hughes's property is marked in red here and encompassed the whole block between Lancaster Pike at the present-day Wayne Movie Theatre and the old route of the railway line. The blue area is the original Cleaver Farm, which stretched from Conestoga Road in the west to Radnor Road in the east. Hughes raised four children here with his wife and childhood sweetheart, Kate Corrie, who had been one of the many subjects of his diary many years earlier. <laughs> Kate was one of the daughters of an immigrant music teacher from London who became organist at St. Augustine's in Philly, where his brother built the organ. He was later organist at the newly built St. Thomas of Villanova, where he was professor of music, and then at Wayne Presbyterian. Hughes himself had become very wealthy from his family's hide and tallow factory near 30th Street, which he continued to run very successfully. He was also an eighth generation descendant of Johann Sebastian Bach, according to his daughter's research, though he may not have known that, and it was probably a coincidence that he married into a family of organists. So back to this photo, dated about 1885, 11 years after his arrival here, and these are some of his progeny. In the center donkey cart are 13-year-old Bessie in the back, Owen, age nine, on the left, and Mary, 10, on the right. The photo also shows their cousins, Harry Bartram, age 10, on the far right with the dogs, and George Bartram, age 9, with the goat and dog cart on the far left. 
If you look closely, there's also a third dog in Mary's lap, but it's almost impossible to see. In the background, we can see their nearest neighbor's house on North Wayne Avenue, about where Main Point Books is now. Right of center is the spire of the original Wayne Presbyterian Chapel, and to its right, the Wayne Opera House and other houses fronting onto Lancaster Pike. Opposite the chapel at that time were pretty much fields as far as the eye could see, farmland about to be developed. And it's at times like this, I think, wouldn't it be great if we could spin the camera around to see more of their surroundings? Well, in this instance, we can. The, the photographer got them all to stay pretty much in the same pose while he or she ran down the hill towards Lancaster Pike and took this shot, showing that they were in fact at the back of their house, the old Cleaver Farm with its eco-friendly water pump. If we were to turn another 90 degrees to the left, we would see the splendid Bellevue Hotel, later demolished after a devastating fire, on the site of where the parking lot is now behind the AT&T building on West Avenue. The archive photo number 11 here is captioned C.P. Fritz Wayne Mailman. <laughs> Christian P. Fritz is seen here crossing a stream on a road in what's now part of the Eastern University campus with the Pennsylvania Railroad pumping station in the background left. And here's a photo taken from a very similar spot dated seven years later. This one is captioned Superintendent Fritz, an engineer Bill Houston, shown in the doorway of the old pumping station, which stood on what became the, the grounds for forming part of the Walton Estate, now Eastern University, in St. David's. Close inspection shows that the same man is definitely in both photos. What we don't know for sure is whether Fritz was correctly captioned as mailman in the first photo, though descriptions I've read do seem to confirm that a wooden box on a bicycle was very much their style. So what do we know about the pumping station behind him here, where he worked? Here I'll refer to a memoir, memoir by H.B. Montgomery in his book Return the Golden Years. The owner of Edgewood, Francis Fenimore, had dammed the little Gulf Creek between Wayne and Radnor in four places. And here we skated in winter, swam in summer, and fished for carp in nearly all seasons. The dams were not intended to provide recreation for the young people of Radnor Township, but water for the Pennsylvania Railroad locomotives. Between the second and third dam was a pumping station where water was pumped through underground pipes for about half a mile to big tanks standing on high platforms beside the railroad tracks between St. David's and Radnor. From here the water ran down into metal sluices that lay between the rails of each of the four tracks. It was not necessary for a train to stop to take on water. As the engine rushed over the sluice, the engineer would let down a scoop situated between the wheels, and the speeding vehicle sucked the water out of the sluice and up into its own tank. After the train had rushed on, you could see the water pouring from the big tanks into the empty sluices. And later, the same tanks would join to the town's main water system, and the pumping station became redundant. And this is the present day map showing how the lakes were later reconfigured for the Walton Estate, now Eastern University. And the bottom right is where the tanks were. But wait, as they say. <laughs> it turns out that Fritz had a third, more dubious source of income. On the 1897 and 1904 Wayne Title and Trust maps, C.P. Fritz is marked as the owner of a property on Highland Avenue. We know it's the same man because they're the only Fritz family in town, and his full name is listed on this street in the 1900 census, where he's identified as being a 50-year-old engineer at the waterworks. In 1913, a very damning report was written entitled Housing Conditions in Mainline Towns. The section on Wayne describes a small area next to our mailman's house, known locally as Fritz Street. It was a narrow alley from the side of his house running onto a small open lot backing onto the Johnson Quarry, near today's Wayne Art Centre. It describes appalling housing conditions which had existed here since about 1890 and the advent of the quarry. By 1900, the same lot is marked as C. L. Fritz, uh, C. L. Fritz Estate, but shows additional housing outlines. And then, by 1908, the P&W came through, and it's marked as J. R. Fritz. That would be his son, John. And it more clearly shows the subdivided housing. And this is a photo from that report showing what it actually looked like 100 years ago. The so-called Fritz Street Alley led to a very long two-story wooden shack with one entrance subdivided into 17 dwellings, nicknamed Brooklyn Bridge. That's the building on the right. The report stated, it housed approximately 70 people, Italian and colored, in single little shacks composed of boards and building paper. 
One hydrant supplied everyone, and there were two privies with eight compartments which overflowed and drained to its one front door. In some shacks, whole families had been born and raised. They were described as resembling chicken coops. Rent was $2 a month per room. Nowadays, that's equivalent to about $50 a month. The report continued. A family of five live in one measuring about 11 feet by 8, with a roof that slopes from 6 to 9 feet high. Two windows, 2 feet square, and the door give light and air. There is one double bed for the five, and the place is swarming with vermin. The walls are papered with newspapers, wrapping paper, and scraps of anything that can be pasted up to keep out the wind. The whole place seems in its squalor, filth, and general state of being about to tumble down. Nearby, 13 Italians live in a four-room house made of sheet metal. Here, five lodgers sleep in a single bedroom, a father and mother, and six children sleeping in another two rooms. There is no shade, and the summer sun must make these places like metallic ovens. So most of these people, if not all, found work in the adjacent quarry. And this housing still existed in 1926, but by 1937 it had been raised. The whole area was then gentrified with the advent of the Highland Homes development. Today that alley is on the approximate site of what's now Fenimore Street off Highland Avenue, and the exact site of this shanty town is now vacant land, just storing building materials and equipment south of the Radnor Trail from the old quarry and Wayne Art Centre. So by comparison, our log cabin family who lived ni nearby a decade earlier were living in the lap of luxury. So it seems from the evidence we now have, our man Fritz was possibly a mailman. He was a waterworks engineer and superintendent at the pumping station, and he was the landlord of what became one of the main line's most notorious shanty towns. And that is the strange story of C.P. Fritz Wayne Mailman. <laughs> My final story is a much more cheerful one, and should bring back some fond memories for at least a few people in this room, since Leanhart's bakery existed right through to 1950. Mrs. Helena Leanhart was a widow and native of Bavaria. She and her son Herman opened their bakery near the southeast corner of the main Wayne crossroads in 1887. Originally it was the only bakery in the area and business continued through three generations until 1950. In this photo the store is decorated for Christmas and we can see on the upper shelf toy horns for sale, possibly for the impending turn of the century New Year's celebrations. If you look closely you can just pick out a reflection of one of the children's faces in the glass cabinet to her right. The bakery had been established in 1882, originally known as Stritzinger's, and when the Leanharts came, they enlarged the frame and brick building themselves to incorporate a steam oven. And here it is, on the far right of this postcard scene from 1907. Leanharts had a small garden at its northeast corner. A patch of shaded green behind a stone wall was topped by an iron railing where Christmas trees were sold. That's just to the right of the two people walking towards us on the right. The large four-storey building housed the whole family, grandmother, son, daughter-in-law, and four grandchildren. In addition, there were several live-in maids paid about $3.50 a week. During the week, 12 bakers from Philadelphia were housed there, each receiving $12.50 and free lodging. The bakers slept in shifts in double beds in a large dormitory. Cake bakers by night and bread bakers by day. It was a round-the-clock business, opening from the early morning till 10 at night or when the last customer had finished eating. Delivery boys were also accommodated on the premises. A stable stood at the back with 10 horses. There were wagons for summer deliveries and sleighs for winter. Upstairs was a family bathroom and downstairs were the quarters for the help. Everyone was fed three meals a day and laundry was done in-house. Deliveries went as far as Bryn Mawr, Newtown Square and Paoli. When outlying farms were reached, a horn was blown and the farmers' wives came to the roadside to buy loaves, five cents each, and other baked goods. Crullers, a deep-fried sweet pastry, and cinnamon buns were ten cents a dozen. Private parties and picnics were catered for, and menus consisted of chicken salad croquettes, fried oysters, and ice cream, all for twenty cents a head. The shop had an oyster bar and twenty marble-top tables in the ice cream parlour to the left of this photo, adjacent to the small garden. Special help was hired to turn the handle on the ice cream machine for major holidays when the bakery became a special attraction. They also made a variety of preserves and catsups, storing them in a special preserve closet. And someone here this evening mentioned that as a child it was his absolute favourite spot in Wayne and asked me not to tell anyone that that's where all his school lunch money went. <laughs>
So your secret is safe with us, John Lewis Montgomery II. <laughs> so here it is today, outlined in red. And this is the close-up showing the whole width of the store. The ice cream parlour and garden were on the left, the bakery and entrance on the right, and it's now split into two separate stores. If we return to the plan showing the early 1870s town layout and the main crossroads at the centre, you can see the store was built directly on what was originally part of West Wayne Avenue, then known as Hall Lane, diagonally across the pike to the old Wayne station. After the railway line and station were moved further north, the extended road was vacated and the larger Presbyterian church was built across it on the north side, and the bakery and a new drug store on the, drug store on the south. North Wayne Avenue then became the route to the new station. West Wayne Avenue was locally known as Hall Lane because to the west it led up to Radnor Hall, also known as Music Fund Hall, and the site of the very first Baptist church where it joined Conestoga Road. But as they say, that's a whole nother story for a whole nother day. So I've really only had time to scratch the surface of about half the images on the wall here today. And my plan is to put the stories behind all the people and buildings in these photos online eventually. And as you've probably gathered, it's a constant work in progress. So I'll be adding to it as time permits. As far as I'm concerned, there's still plenty of history to be written. So I hope everyone continues to enjoy the photos here on the wall, that we all keep asking questions about them, and that we continue to rediscover the stories behind the everyday people who made this fabulous township and wonderful library what it is today. Thank you all for coming. Just a general comment, depth and breadth of your knowledge of this is really, really impressive. And it's, you clearly... Yeah. <laughs> I can edit it down from twice that length. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm a story at the back, so... Um, but when I do the um, website pages, which may take me some time, I will add in more of the story and more citations to the uh, to where the information comes. No, I remember, um, I've done reading, I'm really interested in Dolph Rosengarten, and especially his ancestor that witnessed the Harper's Ferry Raid, if you've ever seen that story, just wonderful, that's an ancestor of Dolph Rosengarten, but I remember re reading about Mr. Rosengarten himself, and when you talked about Highland Avenue, he saw those deplorable conditions, and isn't he the man who made sure that proper homes were, I believe that's what happened, Mr. Yeah, that means about, I remember reading something about that. Mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. At the, the lecture here from Sean Fair, I think they had mentioned. I wouldn't be surprised, I mean, he was uh, quite the philanthropist, so. I found the time to go to the yeah. Phil, you always integrate um, different sources to reveal the broader story. Can you explain 
you know, what draws you first to something? Is it, is it an image that's unusual? Um, and then how do you, what's your sort of process of looking in census records, maps? I'm always dubious about the information that's listed beside the photograph in the first place, if there is any. Um, and sometimes there are clues in the photo which great alarm bells with me and make me dive right in and see if I can find out what the real truth was. Um, there are some obvious sources, there are accounts from the time um, that I will check initially. There are the, the older books that you're familiar with. Um, basically, it, it's, I spend a lot of time doing family trees. Um, when you find a name, and you can uh, lock in the name with the, or associate the name with the building and sometimes find them on a map as well. Then you know that you've got the right person and um, with any luck I can track down descendants and find out something that they might have about them or they may have additional photos. Um, as I said at the beginning, there's any number of rabbit holes you can go down and I just see a photo and get drawn into it and just want to know. I mean like the uh, Spratt's oat cakes, I mean you, you think why? Why that window with nothing but Spratt's oatcakes? Uh, um, and a little bit of delving gives you the answer. How long did it find? How long did it take you to find the family of that little girl in front of them? Uh, the family tree took a day or so. Um, tracking them down, getting them to respond, was a little more tricky. And as I said, I still haven't heard back from them definitively. Um, but I'm hoping to meet here very soon, and if they give me the wrong answer, I'll be very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to cheat tonight, but... <laughs> yes. Are you familiar with a, a Dr. Lee Porter? He was an old-time uh, psychiatrist at Brimmer Hospital that we worked with, and I believe he, he grew up uh, in Wayne, uh, the little boy, he'd go back quite a while because he, he would now be 115 or something. Uh, do you know the name? Uh, I've read the name and I believe he was a bit of a historian as well, is that right? Yes, yes, and he, he was a geologist uh, as a hobby and he uh, donated his uh, collection um, to one of the local college, not Franklin and Marshall, but one of the colleges. That is in that area. Yeah. So in his in his basement, he was like, almost a museum himself of geology. He had a great big house on the Walnut Lane, right. yeah. Three, yeah. 350 Walnut Lane. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Which is Brian's house. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to publish a book about all this? <laughs> so we can buy it? <laughs> well, um, where to begin and where to end? I mean, th these are just 32 pictures from tens of thousands. Um, so the, the process of selection would, would be impossible. I couldn't have chosen, and certainly wouldn't necessarily have chosen these. This was down to the library board, and they did an amazing job. Um, and it's interesting to see what they did pick out, um, although I did kind of push them in the direction of trying to pick something from different areas of rap. Um, so, well, who knows? But picking just a few is going to be so difficult. I mean, there there is... Uh, in existence a book of photos with a few captions. But the stories are, are just phenomenal. And, and in each of book. these, I could just go on for an e forever and ever, because there's always more to be found out about these people. Take it big. <laughs> well, I guess that's it. Did you tell people about how it's on the Oh, well, if anybody wants to browse through the photos, you can go to the radmahistory.org, uh, go to the photo section, and uh, browse through to your heart's content. <laughs> and then, you know, it can take you weeks and weeks. Um, then, I must say that I found out most information by looking at the high resolution versions, and blowing them up and looking at the small detail. and. In enhancing little areas, it's just fascinating to find things that you couldn't normally see. Um, but you get the gist of it on the website, and you certainly get a flavour of what Wayne used to be like. And it, it was very, very different. Then, yes. I was told that the little marble top table in the front foyer of the Historical Society was from Lean Hearts. 
but if anybody had gone to Lean Hearts, please stop by and verify it for us. I wondered that because I, having read the description and then seeing it there, I thought it fits the bill exactly. Too oh, good. Good. Yes. I'm going to get you using more than just Photoshop to um, do some of the uh, photo work. Talk about some of the technology you use. I do use um, basically just Photoshop, but there are any number of ways of doing it. Um, everybody has their own um, pet way of uh, analyzing a photo, pulling it apart, looking at it, enhancing it, and so on. Um, it, it would be impossible to describe, and that would be an entire <laughs> evening in itself uh, of many, many hours to try and explain um, how I went through the process. Um, I have my way, and I'm not sure it's the same as anyone else's. Um, but of course, also, when I'm uh, analyzing these photos, um, I'm doing it from a historical point of view where I want to find out the information that's in there. So quite often, I'll enhance something to find what's there, but then it's a crappy photo. So I'll reverse it back to its, its former state, uh, or blend it much better. But in, in the process of finding out the information, um, you do have to exaggerate things and make the photo look horrible before it is nice. And as I said, um, these were all taken back to black and white, and then I added tints on afterwards just to make a nice balanced uh, uh, display. John, you must have some stories. Keep it seven. Okay, well, thanks very much. Terrific. Thank you.